It was October 13, 1967, the Oakland Coliseum. 4,828 people showed up to be a part of history. The first game of the American Basketball Association, the ABA, it was held. And so a storied, if not short, history began. We're going to talk more about that in the integral role that the Kentucky Colonels played in that as we welcome to the program the co-author of a book and two former players, the Kentucky Colonels of the ABA, next on Outlook. They were the Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association. Some of you may hear that come running in because you want to hear more. Others may go, the what? Never heard of it. Because there is a generation that kind of that's kind of skipped a beat and maybe is not aware of the ABA and the role that the Kentucky Colonels played in it. Welcome to the program, if you will. The co-author of the new book, Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association, Gary West. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here, Bob. In addition, you are joined by two former players. We're excited to have them both with us. Bobby Rasco joins us in addition to Daryl Carrier. And if I've got my numbers right, Daryl, you played from 67 to 72, and Bobby, you were there 67 to 70 Correct. with the ABA. And we're going to show you more about the book, The Kentucky Colonels. But let's talk a little bit, Gary. First of all, you've done eight books, and, and they're all different kinds of subject matter. But why the need to do a book about the Kentucky Colonels? Well, this was getting ready to be a team that was truly a forgotten team. It's, it has skipped a generation. The team was there from 67 to 76. Now years and when they fold in 76 you think about it there's people now that have never heard of the Kentucky Colonels other than maybe a social group that uh, is around the state they might think it's them but this was a viable basketball team that was an integral part of Louisville in the state of Kentucky that had some of the biggest names that have ever played in the game that were part of the Colonels they were owned by colorful owners uh, and just colorful players colorful coaches and then when Lloyd Gardner and I got together a few years ago, Lloyd had a background. He was a manager for Coach Diddle at Western for two years, and he was a manager for Coach Odell for two years. And then when he got uh, involved with the Colonels, he became their trainer. And Lloyd, you know, a lot of us go through life, and we don't have the presence of mind to recognize where we are in life. And I include myself in that group. I thought, oh, if I'd only done this or only done that, Lloyd had the presence of mind to save and collect all this memorabilia. He had diaries he kept, he had records, he had letters from coaches and players, and he kept this stuff in literally boxes in a barn in Louisville. And when we got together, he pulled all this out. And uh, Lloyd, Lo and Lloyd lived it, Bobby and Darrell played it, and I wrote it. There you go. And I want to talk, there's so much to talk about. The real story of a team left behind and the significance of putting something like this together, certainly having all that there was a tremendous help, having the players there to talk about it. As you recollect your time with the ABA, what do you remember most, Bobby? Well, it was a, a very fun time. Uh, it was a, a time whenever uh, uh, players were coming and going almost weekly. Uh, Teams were trying to organize and continuously changing, you know, trying but, to get a better team. Let me interject team. something. The NBA, the National Basketball Association, was also in existence. They began in the late 40s, 46 maybe. So that was your competitor of sorts? Yes, that's, okay. that's correct. And actually, whenever you graduated from college, when there's one draft now, well, there were the two drafts then. Ooh. And they were competing against each other, uh, you know, to see who could get the players that they wanted, you know. So that made it interesting, you know, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, it, it's something that I'll always cherish and I'll never forget uh, and having an opportunity, you know, to play with the Kentucky Colonels uh, the in ABA. those three years in the ABA. Yes. What about you, Daryl? What do you remember most? Knocking heads with the best that's ever played the game, you know. We, we had exhibition games with NBA teams. And if you look back, we beat those teams as much as they beat us. And uh, we, we played the New York Knicks. We played uh, Kareem and his team and Oscar Roberts and all the great players. And uh, so out there competing with the very best and uh, getting a few bruises, a few stitches. And I love the competition. I love the toughness of the game. 
Well, and, and we're going to talk more about that as we go throughout this half hour, just how the game has changed over the years. But what you need to put it, you're being very humble, and Gary, you can help me on this one, because it wasn't to say that you couldn't make it in the NBA. I mean, th it was the same caliber. It, 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 it was. really was, Barb. And what what they're saying, Bobby and, and Daryl could have both played in the NBA. But back then, the NBA salaries and everything weren't what they are today. But they went for the security thing. They played for the Phillips Oilers, which you had a choice. You could go in and have a profession for a lifetime. You played basketball. And then they trained you, and when your playing days were over, you had a, a job with a very solid company, and that was, uh, those were amateur so wait, teams. So wait, so help me out. So so this was a company, the corporation that's now called, is it um, Sunoco? Phillips Conoco. Phillips. They, they were, back then yeah. it was the Phillips Oilers, Phillips. and you had the Akron Go uh, Goodyear team. Okay. Uh, you had the Marathon Oil team that sent guys out there that played in the Olympics and everything else. So when the Colonels formed, Bobby and Darrell, were, were, the owners, were two of the first players that they went after because these are two of the great names in, in Kentucky basketball is Bobby Rasco and Darrell Carrier. But when, when uh, Darrell was talking about some of the great names, what he didn't do is identify some of those great names that are like Dr. J, Rick Berry, George McGinnis, Artis Gilmore, Dan Issel, George Gervin. It goes on and on. And then some of the early day sportscasters, Bob Costas, was with the St. Louis Spirit. Marty Brenneman, who wrote the Forward Fire book, is the voice of the Cincinnati Redlegs. These were guys who broadcasted in the ABA. So, it, and then the, the, the shot clock, the three-point basket, the colored basketball, it was so innovative and everything with what the ABA did. And, and Daryl and Bobby are, are part of that rich history. And we're going to talk a little bit. You know, you grinned so when he said something about that the NBA didn't have the salaries then that they have now. That's an understatement, a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> yeah. But we're going to talk more about that, this rich history, and, and the basketball. It had a red, white, and blue ball. Yep, it was called, a, some of them called it a circus ball. Why it's was that? Well, because it was totally non-traditional. You had the brown leather ball, but George Mikan, one of the great names, was the first commissioner of the ABA, and he wanted something different. And most of the owners in the ABA did not want this basketball. But George Mikan, his influence was so strong that he wanted that basketball, and that's what they got. And today in the NBA shootout, when you'll see the three-point competition at the NBA All-Star Game, the money ball is a red, white, and blue ball that they shoot. Ah, there you have it. You'll win that one on the trivia. <laughs> and so he got it because he could. He could. Because he could. We're going to find out more about the rich history of the Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association right after this. Stay with us on Outlook. Well, we're in an overtime here, and they're going to go back and look at these plays under a microscope, both teams. They're going to be uh, unhappy about some of the calls. You might expect that, but it's a human game of uh, players, officials, timekeepers, <laughs> coaches, fans, everybody involved. And it's so wild out here, I tell you, I'd hate to be the men working this basketball game. It's hard to make the calls with about 16,000 fans screaming all the time. Indiana will have the ball just inside front court. Russell is in for the Colonels. McGinnis with the ball on the right side, gives to Freddie Lewis with 35 seconds to go, 24 on the shot clock. It's a tie game. Stay there. They're trying to isolate Lewis one-on-one -on -one against O'Brien, but he's just holding the ball with 15 seconds on the shot clock. Bring it on out. They're trying to go to Brown. Here's Lewis getting loose to the free throw line. A shot up there. Roll And a team sport indeed. On the program today, we're talking about the Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association. Co-author of the book by the same name, Gary West, joins us in addition to former players Bobby Rasco and Daryl Carrier. If you know basketball and you know basketball in Kentucky, you know those two names. Welcome back to the program. Let's talk a little bit about the NBA, ABA monopoly and the bidding wars that resulted. Okay, so the NBA at the time had a monopoly. Then here comes the ABA. Okay, now we got some competition going on. The ABA was formed by a gentleman out of uh, California named Dennis Murphy. And his whole purpose for forming this league was to eventually get 
engulfed and bought up by the NBA where he would make millions if they merged, a lot like the NFL and the AFL a number of years ago. So he that, went in with that. The, he went purpose? in with that sole thing that we're going to huh. start this league and we're going to be competitors and they're going to pay us to join their league. That was what he did. But then the NBA Players Association did not want that merger and fought that merger literally for nine years so it would cause the player's salaries to escalate and they could make more money because if they knew if they formed what brought those two teams there, there would be no competition. Uh -huh. So they liked this and uh, that's sort of how that thing played out. A lot of court battles, a lot of committee meetings, but it was something else. And then all of a sudden the ABA gets a lot of money and they start getting some of the great players to jump over from the, uh, the NBA and play for them. So you were there, Bobby, from 1967 to 70. You look now at what these guys are making in the NBA. You too, Daryl. And you, you probably thought, whew, if only, huh? We, give me a, <coughs> give me a, what salaries we might we were making a lot of money back then. Yeah. Well, what were some, yeah. give me, what were yeah. some of the salaries? We were making a lot of money. And they were. Back then, for know? the time. Uh, yeah. You know, it's t what, what's today, back then, is 10 times more today than it, you know, if he's making 10,000. That's a hundred thousand a day or yeah. more. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a dollar would take you a long ways back then. So we had uh, the NBA started uh, <clears throat> getting some of your very best players in their area. Back then, Dan Issel was close to Kentucky, so mm -hmm. Kentucky Colonels wanted Dan Issel. Okay, in, at Indiana, Rick Mount they wanted uh, the boy close gotcha. to close sure. to the. So they. The uh, NBA would draft players from anywhere, so the ABA were really sharp. They try to get the players close. So the top six or eight players, when we first started, half of them went to the NBA and half of them went to the ABA. ABA paid it as much or more than the NBA, and uh, so it was uh, it's quite a bit in war. And when the players first got started, they were making very modest salaries but more than the NBA players were used to making. And after a little bit, uh, the salaries start escalating uh, because players were jumping from one league to the other and it took. But most importantly, you were doing what you love. You got to play basketball. So you're there, the ABA's taken off. We got this bidding war going on. Things are going pretty well. And the Kentucky Colonels, they're an integral part of this. They are, and, and the Colonels were one of the last teams that was brought into the mix because they couldn't find anybody with the, with the financial ability to buy this franchise, uh -huh. which cost something like $35,000. Now, if you can believe Whoa, this, to get, in, to get first in there. And Joe, in the and Joe and Mamie Gregory stepped, stepped up then. They were into the dog breeding business, and she was a, an heiress to gold mines, silver mines, newspapers. Her grandmother owned the Hope Diamond. Oh it was unbelievable. Mamie actually played with it as a little girl and she married Joe Gregory who was from over at Hardensburg in Breckenridge County and he was a dog trainer and everything, 37 years old. She was 23 years old and she brought her money into it and as she told Lloyd and I, I bought this team for my husband Joe. And she was quite a character and still is to this day a character. Now, to show you how much money she had, she's driving in a pickup truck down 4th Street and Broadway in Louisville past V.V. Cook, and she looks over and sees a red Corvette, and she says, I want that. So she pulls her pickup truck over and goes in and says, I'd like that Corvette, and do you want to drive it, ma'am? No, I want, I want it. And he said, well, how do you plan to pay for it? And she said, cash. He says, well, we need to go in. He said, I'll write you a check, so I need to call your bank. Well, the, she called the bank, and the banker says, you can take a check from Mrs. Gregory all the way up to $52 million. <laughs> so she drove, drove off with the red Corvette that day. What a great story. And there's story, story after story. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and one of the reasons that Bobby and Daryl went there, the, the Gregory's really liked them, and Daryl worked on their farm for several years uh, that they had. So, so in a di you mean prior to being a part of the ABA or while you were? While I was with the ABA, I managed their farm. They had a large farm. And during the summers, I would raise cattle and raise tobacco, and uh, and I had some good benefits. I'd say, let's take us inside, okay, players. You you can give us a perspective that no one else can. Well, let me tell you about Joe Gregory, the owner. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I went in for a tryout, you know, to make the team. So the tryout was 
a two-on-two -two game down at the Louisville YMCA game with Joe up here in the, in the stands watching, and the, he he knew the you know my playing ability and so forth against Daryl and another couple of guys, and so we played two or three games to uh, you know to 20, 24, and then there it was over with, and Joe says, well, I think you know we'd like to sign you, <laughs> so you know that was. And you didn't trial. have agents, right? There were no, no agents. No it was agent. You. That, was, that was it. You Guess were doing what? your. You got a two year no cut right on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that. Just like mm -hmm. that. But he did it. Bobby, of course, an All American at Western and, and a great reputation. And Daryl, an All American. And, oh, he knew what and, he was doing. And, they were, and, and there was such an influence from Western on this team. The very first coach was Johnny Gibbons. And Johnny's initial record was 5 and 12, so he was fired. And they brought in Gene Rhodes, who had been John o on John Oldham's staff here at Western. So then Gene Rhodes became the coach. He was a Western guy. And then you had uh, uh, Jim McDaniels, who later on oh, played. Yeah. Wayne Chapman was a heck of a player. And then you had that great Kentucky influence with Dan Issel and Larry Conley and Louis Dampier and Tommy Cron. Oh, yeah. It just Mike goes Pratt. on. Mike Pratt. It just goes on cotton and on. Age. Such a cotton, cotton age. Good. Uh, and Larry Conley. One of the big names in Kentucky basketball played that very first game for the Colonels. He started that very first game. Next day, went off to the Army and never played another professional game again. So he's a wow. footnote to history. He played one game as a professional, started it, and never played another game. Go <laughs> figure that so. out. So Joe Gregory, just one of the colorful owners one along of the, color, the way. Oh, and, the, and the, then we their go dog on. Ziggy was the mascot. I love it. I and, love uh, it. Ziggy had a seat for every game on the road and, and at home. So at what point then does the, the Brown family come in, the John Y. Browns? The, the John Y. and them bought, he formed a group with uh, Wendell Cherry and David Jones and Stuart Jay and David Grissom and John Y. Brown. Some of the Louisville and money And then they people. bought it and then they were getting ready to move the team to Cincinnati. Why? Through, well, they felt like they could draw better in Cincinnati. They started out playing 10 or 15 games in Cincinnati. Played two or three games here at Diddle Arena. The Colonels did. Uh, they played a few in Lexington, Memorial Coliseum uh, in Cincinnati, and then it looked like they were going to move the, some. The Cincinnati group got involved, and they were getting ready to get majority ownership, and John Wise said, I'm going to buy the team. So he and Ellie Brown bought it and made her chairman of the board. It was an all-woman board. And of all things, they brought Adolf Rupp in as president of the Colonel. Oh, there's another piece of history. We're going to have a test it's, after this. It just goes it on just and on. It just goes on and on. And we've got more going on and on. We're talking about the Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association on this edition of Outlook. More with Bobby Rasco, Daryl Carey, and Gary West when Outlook continues. Stay with us. The infamous red, white, and blue basketball. The Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association, that's the subject of our show today. I'm Barbara Deeb, and I am joined by Gary West, Bobby Rasco, and Daryl Carrier. Some of you who are familiar with the Kentucky Colonels remember those names, indeed you do. That's the new book. We, we talked about your, your tenure with the Kentucky Colonels and how much that meant to you as players you know you were both mr kentucky i mean they were looking for you so you could have gone to the nba you chose to go to the aba now you don't regret those decisions well Excuse go me. ahead Nero. no you can I speak first i don't regret any move i made uh i left uh, bobby was with the uh phillips 66ers and and i decided to join him because we'd played together here at Western. We played with the Phillips 66ers together, and then we played with the Kentucky Colonels. We were on three different teams. Uh, and with the uh, Phillips Oilers, we, uh, and I know we're not supposed to be talking about Phillip Oilers, but that was where we started. Uh, they, we traveled to 23 foreign countries, played in the Pan American Games, played in, in a couple of world tournaments. And then uh, with all of that experience, uh, and I was asked to play in the Olympics, and I decided that I wanted to sign a two-year no-cut contract, so I couldn't huh. wait around for the Olympics. Uh, Bobby signed a two-year no-cut, and uh, so we just had a great experience in, in basketball back then. Well, I want days. you to look at that picture right there, number 35 and number 45. Yes, you look just the same. You haven't changed a bit. There you are. <laughs> right. And uh, in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, <laughs> 
And of course, that's Daryl number 35 and Bobby number 45. Uh, Barb, what Daryl has said, Daryl Carrier is considered one of the greatest shooters to ever play the game of basketball. And Louis Dampier was considered one of the greatest shooters. And those two were a backcourt tandem for the Colonels <laughs> for several years. And they were unbelievable the way that uh, they could shoot the basketball. And I remember going up and watching them, and for every three pointer, they got so much uh, gasoline from Marathon Oil that was a sponsor for the Colonels game, yeah. 20 gallons. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Daryl had told me that he told Louis, says, well, we'll never have to know, buy another gallon of gas the rest of our lives. They were hitting so many three-point shots and everything. <laughs> so they, and it was getting to that point so quickly, they kind of changed the rules on, on uh, Louis and, and Daryl a little it. bit. I love it. Let's talk about shooters. the rule changes, well, I, too. Well, I'd like to add a little bit about playing with those two guys. I imagine. You know, I was known in college and with Phillips being a pretty much of a scorer, too. But you know what I got to do with the Colonels? I learned how, if I wanted playing time, to play defense. <laughs> so I, play, I got to be known as a, as a defensive, defensive player, player. And, and get the ball to these guys, and they certainly could. They were a duo uh, that no other team had in the whole league while we were playing and shooting the three-pointers, and they were both terrific at it. And Darrell, by the way, led the league several years in, uh, in three-point field goal percentage. So, that's huge. That's huge. But let's talk about when you look at the game now, from the game that you played in the 70s, how has it changed? I think you have better shooters back then. <clears throat> and the reason I say that, right now they want you to lift a lot of weights and get strong. Uh, and I think lifting a lot of weights is for football. And you develop a basketball <laughs> muscle the more you shoot a basketball. If you shoot thousands of shots, you'll develop a basketball muscle. And you don't need to interfere that with uh, football muscles. And, and Interesting. Might work again. Do you agree, Bob? I, I think uh, basically back then you had a little more team play basically than what you have now. They they, they well, do a lot of one-on-one -on -one play, yeah. and the guys are terrific at doing that. And uh, that's what they do now, uh, you know, far as an offense is concerned. Back then it was a little bit more of a team play, passing the ball. Uh, and that type thing. Too many superstars now? We had ah. superstars back then. Yeah. Sure. But yeah. I mean, it, they are really focused on that now. Yeah. yeah. Superstars pretty much run the show now. Back then, the superstars didn't run the show. Coaches would run the show. Management would run the show. But now, <clears throat> some of these superstars, they decide when they want to go go in, come they out call the, the game, shots, no pun and they call yeah. the shots. I'll tell you one thing that's really changed really changed is the influx of foreign players nowadays. Mm -hmm. Back then, there was practically none that were, you know, playing. Maybe one or two or three in the whole league. But now, my goodness, you know, every team seems to have two or three foreign players and very good ones at that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's changed. And maybe also the size of the players. I think there's more big players as a result maybe of some of the foreign players. And, you know, there's a bunch of those seven-footers that, are, you know, come into the league and play. And you know, so that's a couple of things I think sure. has changed. Starting off back in the high school days, Bobby was here at Western, and uh, Diddle was recruiting me. Coach Diddle was recruiting, and I said, he said, you can go up and play with a Bobby, the great Bobby Rasco. And I said, I love that. So I came up here, and Bobby whipped me around and just whipped me around to score <laughs> So he really, Bobby taught me more basketball than anybody that I've ever been around. And he's my hero. Bobby's my <clears throat> hero today. Well, he's kind to say that, but, you know, it's like one of, taking somebody under your wing and you, you kind of help them along the way. And before long, you know, they're whipping you. That's <laughs> Daryl Carrier. <laughs> What's the greatest skill you need to have to be an effective basketball player? What's, I what's the best I think you skill? need some, some quickness and, and some knowledge of the game. Uh, need to keep the ball at triple threat position. That's right here where you can shoot quickly or put it on the floor quickly or pass it. Uh, triple threat, that's shoot, pass, and, and dribble. And, uh, you know, with the guys tall and quick, you got to be able to get a shot off just snap of your finger really quick or you get them blocked. So I, Bobby and I would learn from each other how to be going down the court, 
really fast and push her man at the right time and go up as he's going backwards. So little tricks of the trade. And then they would be guarding you really close and you couldn't do anything with them. So you'd use their weight to your advantage. You'd pull them, push them, get uh -huh. just a lot of things. Use your hands. So you yeah. really had to be smart. You well, really you had, to, had to do everything you could to hope to get the referee it. doesn't catch you. Yeah. <laughs> you had to do everything you could do yes. to, to get advantage of the defense. Well, and obviously these are skills that were either in your DNA or that you passed down because, of course, you're the father of Josh Carrier, who uh, spent some time at the University of Kentucky and made a name for himself. That's got to feel good to have that legacy, huh? Well, I had two sons, and both of them were tremendous ball, ball players, players in high school, and, and uh, both of them had Division One scholarship offers. And uh, so uh, I do feel good. But, but I worked with them when they were small, and we'd go to the gym every day and make ten straight threes before we'd leave. And I have a gym there at my home, so that was a big advantage. Oh, I bet. Bobby, what about you? Well, I think when you think about basketball, the greatest trait an individual can have, and the most important is they keep score. So you got to be a good shooter, not only field goals, but also free throws. And uh, that's very, very important. And we see Nowadays, we see some guys playing, even on Western's team, that could improve a lot in their shooting ability, in their percentage is what I'm talking about. And uh, I don't know, that's something that you've got to practice, 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 and have confidence that your shot's going to go in. And, and leave it at that. And yes. if you want to find out more about the Kentucky Colonels of the American Basketball Association, you can get a hold of Gary West's book, Gary West along with Lloyd Pink Gardner. What a pleasure. Daryl Carrier, Bobby Rasco, and Gary West, the Kentucky Colonels of the ABA. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara D. We're glad you joined us. And, of course, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Until next time, thanks for being here. Okay.